Revelation chapter 2. Read a few verses here through chapters 2 and 3. We're going to try to answer a question this morning that has been attempted to answer, be answered before in the past. Um, some have answered it well, some I believe not so well. We'll see if we can't answer it for, uh, for us today. Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to start in verse 7. We're going to kind of bounce around from verse to verse. We're not going to read a, the whole thing. We'll have to spend context when we get there. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Behold... Seven, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now jump ahead to verse 11. Same chapter. It says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Now jump down to verse 17. Verse 17, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, will give him the white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that received it. And then verse 26, says, He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Now go up to chapter 3, Verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. And finally, verse 21. Verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and I am set down with my Father in his throne. Alright, so, in each of the verses, we see a similar statement. Anybody pick up on that similar statement? He that overcometh. He that overcometh. Absolutely. So in each of these seven instances, each one written to one of the seven churches of Asia, we see this statement that and is directed to him that overcometh, and then along with that is given some great promise, a reward of some sort, that the person that overcometh will receive. So that this demands the question that has been asked many times before by many Christians, has been sought to be answered, some well, not some not so well. Who is he that overcometh? Are we speaking about just one person because it says he? Or are we speaking about whoever overcomes? We're speaking about many. So number one, who is he that overcometh? And number two, how do you overcome? What do you overcome? See, we're not, we're not given to that here in the scripture, are we? All we see is he that overcometh, him that overcometh. Now I mentioned ways it just written about one person because when I was doing some studying on this, there was a question of, somebody said, well, it seems to me this is just talking about one person. That there's one person who's going to overcome. And that this is all the same person, and all these, well, so there's only one person? No, no, no. Because we see verses in the Bible very similar to that, you know. Uh, Whosoever uh, will may come. We see, uh, uh, oh, I had one in my mind now, I forgot. It. But uh, oftentimes we see that term, uh, him, that, uh, and it refers to not just one person. It refers to whoever is that person. Whoever does this. So whoever overcomes. Uh, can anyone be an overcomer? Uh, 
do we overcome through some sort of spiritual plan, some sort of series of exercises that we must perform in order to be an overcomer? I mean, well, well, we don't really see anything here in Revelation. Seven times, he that overcomes. Overcomes what? How can I overcome? And this has been, again, a big question asked many times. So I want to see what some others had to say on the subject, so I went to my handy dandy interwebs, uh, and I googled the term, him that overcome. And I just want to give you a couple examples of some of what was said. A website called Active Christianity, it's a good name, I like that, Active Christianity, our Christianity ought to be an active thing. And they, the writer there says this, so he created mankind with the express intention that they should rule over sin. His entire plan is that mankind should live a life where they hate and resist sin and say yes to him. And I would agree with that. We should resist sin. We should seek to uh, say yes to Christ over sin. But then he makes the jump where he says to overcome. He associates those two things together. They hate and resist sin, say yes to him, to overcome. One who overcomes sin in their life is proving that God's way is perfect and is part of the work of abolishing sin for all eternity. Each one who does this will taste the rich rewards of living such a life. These promises apply to all who overcome. Alright, so in a, in, in a sense, this writer is saying that by, that by overcoming all sin, by living a sinless life, sin-free, that we have now overcome and will get the rewards mentioned in Revelation because we have stood firmly against sin for our life. What was the problem with that? I've got a question, okay? How many sins? All sins? What if we resist all sin and then accidentally fall back and fall into a sin? Does that ever happen to any of us? It happens all the time. It happens all the time. Even Paul the Apostle lamented over it. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. And he even understood that in the body we sin. Um, so at what point can we lose it? If we fall to one sin, have we now, everything we've done up to this point is all blown? Now we have to start over and hope that we'll get past enough sin that the Lord will allow us. Uh, uh, what if we have that situation like some people talk about where you live your whole life resisting sin, doing the right thing, doing everything good, standing up for the Lord, and then you're walking down the street and your eye gets caught by a pretty girl. I'm talking to the guys here, of course. Um, ladies, you can say it, handsome man. And you, and you turn your head and you go, wow. You know, and, 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 and wow, that's a good looking woman. Then you walk out of traffic and get hit by a truck. You're dead. Has your whole life now been blown because of one act of lust at the end of your life? Now you don't get any of the promises. You see, here's the problem with when we have to rely on our ability to keep from sin. Is it overcoming to keep from all sin? We'll find out. Let's look at another one. So with that first one, it seems a little faulty. There's a lot of questions in Another site called the Journal of Biblical Accuracy. We want biblical accuracy. They don't use the King James Bible, but they think they're accurate. So we'll see what they say. They write, It is amazing all that is promised to the one who overcomes. To the one who perseveres to the end, who keeps the works and the words of Jesus, even unto the point of death. Now you see, we're seeing here this exact same thing, aren't we? The person who lives perfectly follows the Lord constantly, never falls, uh, right up until the day they die. Everything I've done, I'm an overcomer. However, many today believe that they do not need to overcome anything. They believe all was done and dusted for them in the time past at that one moment of faith. And of course, he is talking of that time where we were born again. They believe it was all done and dusted for them in time past. So in this writer's mind, our act of faith starts and ceases at the moment we're born again. Now, there are some who are, I've met who are that way. They ostensibly get saved, 
say a little prayer, and then go on and live your life, live your life like the devil. I would say they're not saved. Because the Bible says you, if you're saved, you're going to bear fruit. But the Bible doesn't say if you, if you are saved, you're going to be perfect from then on and do everything always right. The Bible speaks glaringly against that idea. So they say uh, that our, this one act of faith is all that we need. It starts and finishes there. And now we're good to go. And everything is fine because we have that one act of faith. But the problem is for the Christian, we don't just have that one act of faith. We have an initial act of faith when faith becomes real. But then faith continues. Faith endures. Faith is the, 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 the qualifying aspect of our life from that time forward. We may not do everything right, but we still have faith. Faith sustains us. Faith holds us to the Lord, even in times of difficulty. When, when my wife went to the hospital, I hate to keep bringing that up, but you got to go with what's there, right? you got to go with a good example. Uh, when, when she went in there, it was only my faith that held me. The first two weeks, I didn't know if she was going to live or die. And I realized in that time that only my faith in Christ mattered. I loved my wife, but the Lord could take her any time. I can lose my wife, I can lose my family, I can lose my job, I can lose my home, I can lose the church, I can lose anything, but Christ will always be there. And that is the faith that must sustain the believer. So my life is not dependent on one act of faith 40 years ago when I was 8 years old. More than 40 years ago. My faith is continual. So this guy's got the wrong idea that we have one act of faith over here, and now suddenly everything is fine, and we're going to do another thing for the Lord. No, faith endures. Do I do everything right? No. But faith continues. But the point is, is he right? Is it the issue of the one who perseveres to the end, who keeps the works, keeps the works of Jesus, even unto the point of death? So you have no end of, or no, I'll say no lack, of opinion on who is an overcomer and how you overcome. There's a lot of opinion out there. But can we find something in Scripture that answers that question? Is there something hidden away in there? Or are we left to just guess, can I be an overcomer? What do I have to do? Who do I listen to? Who's got the answer? Well, folks, I'm here to tell you the Bible's got the answer. The Lord doesn't leave us to flounder and wonder. How do I do it? In fact, it's remarkably plain. Go back just a couple of books to the book of 1 John. Little tiny books. Just real, just before Revelation. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. 1st John, not the Gospel of John, 1st John, chapter 5, I'm going to start in verse 1. Okay, so can we find an answer in the Bible that will tell us who are they to overcome, how do we overcome, lots of opinions, but what does the Bible say? 1st John, chapter 5. You're not in the Gospel of John, right? Okay. Verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Okay, that's important. Remember that. We're going to be coming back to that. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For, now listen, for whatsoever is born of God What's that word? Overcome. Overcome. Everybody said, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh. overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh, overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Pastor, is it that simple? Yeah. The people reject it because, oh, it can't be that simple. And yet, there it is in black and white. Don't have to 
interpret anything into it. It says it right there. So the plain, simple answer, verse 1, or verse 1 starts out, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And verse 4 says, For whatsoever is born of God, those who believe that Jesus is the Christ, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. It's that simple. We overcome because we believe in Christ. Or if you will, we believe on Christ. And if that's not clear enough, it goes on and says, And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So this guy up here who says they believe it was all done and dusted for them in time past in that one moment of faith, yes, absolutely. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Not our works, our faith. And if that's not clear enough, verse 5 says, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? They say it like numerous times, numerous ways, all of these verses right here. And it makes it so abundantly clear that you can't deny it. If you are born again in Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, is the Messiah, then you have overcome the world. Not through your efforts, not through your works, not through your perseverance, but because you believe in Christ. Now, there are those who I suspect will argue that this uh, specifies that it is overcoming the world. So they'll say, well, that's different than what Revelation is talking about. Really, where does it say what we're to overcome in Revelation? It doesn't say it, does it? It just says, he that overcomes. So what they do is they take he that overcomes, and then they add a little line there, and put parentheses around it, and add their own terminology. He that overcometh sin. He that overcometh the devil. He that overcometh whatever I think you ought to overcome. But that's not what Revelation says, does it? It says, he that overcometh. Period. So why would we think it wouldn't be he that overcometh the world? The same guy wrote it, John. John was given the revelation to write. John was given the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John to write. Makes sense, he used the same terminology to mean the same thing. I don't see it as a problem. The world is the world system, and the world system has as its head Satan. Satan is the God, little g, God, not big G, of this world. The Bible says that. So when we overcome the world, we overcome Satan. Satan is the father of sin. So if we've overcome the world, we've overcome Satan, we've overcome Satan, we've overcome sin, What's the problem? And in case it doesn't seem like overcoming the world is really such a big deal or enough to warrant these kinds of promises, I'll keep your place here and look over at the Gospel of John, chapter 16. The Gospel of John, chapter 16. And we're going to see why it is that faith in Christ is what gives us the place of being, of having overcome the world. John chapter 16, verse 33. John chapter 16, verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you. Okay, this is Jesus speaking. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have what? Overcome, overcome the, world. the world. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus overcame the world. When we place our faith in Jesus, we overcome the world.
place our faith in Christ unto salvation, we overcome through him that has overcome. Now, other writers on the subject seem to think that because the issue of overcomers in Revelation is in a particular book of prophecy, it must be something else. It must be some special class of believers. Uh, somebody that does, every, does everything right. Somebody that lives successfully for the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Somebody that stands above the rest. Some great warrior for Christ standing bloodied and beaten and battered in the battle before he goes to heaven. Here's your overcomer. That's not what it says. And again, I find it interesting that with the exception of one time in 1 Peter, that the term overcome or overcometh is used always by John. He uses it in Revelation. He's the prophet in Revelation who described the words of Christ, speaking of those overcoming. He writes about it there in 1 John, uh, what we just read in 1 John chapter 5. He also writes about it in 1 John chapter 2. Go back to 1 John again, go to chapter 2. Hope you kept the place there so we can get right to it. 1 John chapter 2. Now, verses 13 and 14. 1 John chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. It says, I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. So twice we see again that those who he's writing to, which are born-again Christians, have overcome the wicked one. And who's the wicked one? Satan. Who's the wicked one? Satan. And Satan is the God, little g, of this world. So we have overcome the world. Overcome Satan. Because Christ overcame the world and overcame Satan. We are the overcomers. There's one more promise made to he that overcometh in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Revelation 21, 7. So in Revelation 20, 21, where it says, 
that we have, that we will, that him that overcometh will inherit all things. Well, we're told we have an inheritance. We will inherit. Why? Because we are the overcomers. An overcomer is one who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ and has been justified or declared righteous through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It isn't about our work. It isn't about our efforts. It is about what Jesus did, about His work, about His work on the cross, His death, His burial, and His resurrection when He overcame the world and Satan. He did the work, and we took hold by faith on that work. Believed in Him, trusted in Him, cried unto Him for forgiveness and salvation. And He saved us through His faithfulness, and He made us overcomers. We have overcome the world. That's why it's so important as Christians not to live like the world, not to partake in the sins of the world. Because we've overcome it all. We don't have to stand in, 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 in the things that hold us back, in those things of the world, because we've overcome. And through Christ, we can let those things go. A lot of Christians just keep hanging on to all the things that we've supposedly overcome. You've overcome it, man, get rid of it. Be done. We can because we have overcome. It's not future, it's past. We became overcomers the day we were born again. By grace we are saved through faith, and by faith we are overcomers. And by faith in Jesus Christ who bought us, we are given many great precious promises. There in, in, in Revelation we're promised life and glory alongside the saints, to receive an inheritance, to eat the fruit of the tree of life, to not be harmed by the second death, to receive a new name and glory, to help rule over the nations, to be clothed in white raiment, which the Bible says is the righteousness of the saints, to be a pillar in the temple of our God, and to sit with the Lord at His throne. All these are promised to the overcomers. And praise God, through Christ, if we are His, we have overcome. We are the overcomers. There's no wondering how do we do it. It's already done. If you're born again, you've overcome. These gifts are the gifts of, of faith. They're not rewards. They're gifts. Because we're the children of God. Now remember though, just because we're overcomers through faith alone in Christ doesn't mean that we aren't to live for Him as best as we can. In fact, because we're overcomers, because the Lord has died for us, because He rose again and saved us, because He's given us such wonderful promises, that's the very reason why we ought to live for Him. He's given us everything, both in this life and in the life to come. Do not we owe Him something back? We will receive rewards for the life we live, or lose rewards for the life we live, but some things are promised to those who overcome. And if we're born again, and we're trusted in Christ, we have overcome. But we should live our lives in a way that recognizes it and appreciates it and tries to give back some tiny little smidgen back to the Lord. Show our gratitude. Exactly. Show our gratitude. We can never repay Him for what He's given us. But we should do everything we can to try. Give Him as much as we can. We gotta follow him, get rid of the sin that so easily besets us, overcome every weight. Let's live our lives in gratitude to our Savior and to our God, who through Jesus Christ, through his labor, through his work, we are overcomers. And will one day sit with him in heaven. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord, for your word. Lord, I, I don't understand why so many people read these verses in Revelation and wonder what does that mean? 
How, how am I an overcomer in it? And, and, and throw their own spin onto it, throw their own ideas onto it, Lord God. And yet you've made it so plain, so clear, it's just right there. And Lord, I thank you, Lord God, that we don't have to rely on our own abilities, or if you will, our own inabilities, Lord, to, to try our best to, to overcome, Lord God. Because just like in salvation, Father, so you have saved us, so you have caused us to be born again, and so you have made us through that overcomers already. And Lord, I just pray, oh God, that we would live our lives in a, in a way of gratitude, in a way of appreciation, Father, showing you that we appreciate that which you've given to us. And showing the world, Lord, the great gift that you've bestowed upon us of eternal life. So that others might be brought to you. Others might overcome the world as well through Jesus Christ. Father, again, I thank you, Lord, that you laid it out so clearly in your word. So clearly, in fact, I, I suspect that to some people it's, that's actually going to be a stumbling block. It's how can it be so simple? How can it be so plain and out there? How can it not be about me? Well, Lord, my Christianity is not about me at all. Not one aspect of it, Father. Anything I do, Lord, I only do for you. And Lord, I just pray, oh God, that each one of us would understand that as well and seek to live our lives for you. Father, now as we finish up, Lord, we partake of, of the Lord's Supper, Father, and remember that sacrifice made for us, Lord, and I pray, oh God, that you would just make it alive to us once again, Father. Um, the, the reason you've given us this remembrance, Father, is to always bring it on a regular basis to our mind just what it is that you've done for us. And I thank you so much for it. We lift you up, Father. We lift up Jesus Christ. We give you the praise and the glory. We pray it in Jesus' name.